Okay, we're starting Parshas Hazino. Hazino is a very cryptic, uh, it's very cryptic, cryptic, poetic, whatever, page 1100. Page 1100. Mayor, where did you daven? In here, you daven in Ar Samach? Wow, Okay. Huh? We're nice davening. Okay. Page 1100. 1100. Okay. Can I slum? Okay, I say if I do be to close the close the door over there. No, no. So. Okay. So it says like this: Hazinu Hashemayim Vada Beira V'Sishma Ha'Oretz Imrefi. Now you notice that it's written in a poetic form. That's the structure you see in a Sefer Torah. It's written in two columns because it's like a, it's like a, a what's called a shira, which is a song, shiras ha'azinu. So it's like what we would call a, uh, you know, I don't want to use a poem. I want to say I don't want to call it a poem, but it's some sort of, uh, some sort of. I don't even know what a synonym would be for a poem in English. Uh, maybe a dirge. Not sure, but whatever it is, it sounds like this. Moshe Rabbeinu calls the heavens and earth to witness. For everything that has come up until this point. And he says, Ha'azinu ha'shamayim v'adabera, pay attention heavens and I will speak. V'sishma ha'oretz imrefi, and the earth shall hear the words of my mouth. Now, the, uh, if you, let's, let's just look at Rashi for one second. Because I want you to see what the, the basic idea going on here is. Page 1100 for anybody who just came in. Rashi says, Ha'azinu ha'shamayim, pay attention heavens, first Rashi. Shani Masre Bahem be Israel. I'm warning the Jewish people. Vitiu Atem Eidai Badovar. You, the heavens and the earth, are going to be my witnesses. Shekacha Marti Lahem. Shatem Tiu Eidim. I told the Jewish people that you're going to be the witnesses. Meaning what? Vilama Heid Vahem Shemaim Vaaretz. Omar Moshe. Moshe said, Why did he call the heavens and earth into witness? Moshe said, Ani Basar Vadam. I made of flesh and blood. Lemochar ani meis, I'm going to be dead tomorrow. This is actually the last day of Moshe's life. Im yomer Yisrael lo kibalnu aleinu abris. If the Jewish people say we never accepted the covenant, mi bo makhishem. Who's going to who's going to contradict them? Who could deny? Who could contradict the Jewish people? Leficha cheid b'em shemaim ve'oretz. Therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu called the heavens and earth to witness against the Jewish people. Edim shehem kayomim lolam. These are witnesses that are eternal. They exist forever. The so what does that mean? The ode. First of all, the witnesses are always going to be here. The heavens and earth are always going to be here. So it's, again, there's not going to be a problem that the witnesses are not around. Number one. The ode, and furthermore, page 1100. Shim Yizku, if the Jewish people are meritorious, the witnesses will provide the reward. If the Jewish people are meritorious, what will be? Hagefen titein piria, the vines will produce their fruit. Ve'oret titein yuvula, the earth will produce its produce. The earth, will, the heavens will rain. The Jewish people are meritorious, so the the witnesses themselves will provide the the reward. and if the Jewish people are liable, if they're if they're if they're guilty, then the witnesses will strike them first. The there won't be rain. Okay, so everybody should have a chumash. By the way, page eleven hundred. So the, 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 the Moshe Rabbeinu says, I'm calling the heavens and the earth as witnesses to the Jewish people. A, because these are witnesses that are going to be around forever. These are witnesses that are always going to be around. There's no problem that the witnesses are ever going to go lost. On well, page 1100, there's no problem the witnesses are going to go lost because the heavens and earth are always here. And number two, the heavens and the earth will serve as either the rewarders or the punishers if the Jewish people are deserving. So the rain will come, and there will be produce, and there will be earth will produce. It will be wonderful. And if the Jewish people are step out of line, so then the heaven's not going to rain, and the earth is going to be, what do you call it? The earth is going to be, uh, is not going to produce. Take, uh, take, take Chumashim, gentlemen. There's Chumashim on the shelf over there, uh, page 1100. So that's, that's, that's what Moshe calls the heavens and the earth in. Now, uh, the, first, the first idea here is that, that the effects of, of uh, uh, the rain, the, 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 the heavens and the earth, is that, that it, it, like the Torah says, you have these perpetual witnesses. Then the Torah says like this, Moshe Rabbeinu goes on. Now pay attention carefully, because there's a lot, there's a tremendous amount on each pasuk here. Yarof kamotor likhi, my 
teaching will come down like rain. How do they translate? Drop like rain. Tizal katal imrasi. And my words will drip like dew. How does he? They, my, uh, they will flow like dew. Kiseirim alei desha. Like storm winds upon vegetation. Vikirvivim alei esef. And like raindrops on the blades of grass. So Moshe Rabbeinu describes the Torah. He says, my words will come down like rain and like dew. Which means that the Torah is compared to rain and dew. Now we've said many times Torah is first of all, Torah is first of all compared to, uh, compared to water. Why is Torah compared to water? Because water is the basic sustenance of life. Torah is the basic sustenance of spiritual life. Water, Torah is always compared to water. Water also, water also flows to the lowest point. Wherever you drop water, water always finds the lowest point. There is very little in, in the world as destructive as water. Water, if you have a home, and there's water seepage in a home, there's water in a home, uh, very few things are as bad for a home as water. I'm getting hit by lightning, is no party either, but, but, uh, but, but water, you know, if there's is it walls suffer, and I have a friend right now who has to move out of his house. He lives here in Israel, in, 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 the, in uh, the Matersdorf area. He has to move out of his house because he's living on a ground floor, and there's actually his entire apartment is in a big building. The rest of the building is fine because it's built on the pillars. He's on the ground floor, and the, he noticed the crack between the top of the wall and the ceiling, and the crack started getting bigger. And the engineers came in, and they said, yeah, his, his apartment, the, low, the ground floor apartment, is sinking. It's actually sinking. And then he had another engineer who took a look at it. He said, get out of here as fast as you can. You know, the, the whole thing like, is in danger of collapsing. So what happened, what they discovered is all the other neighbors they have their drain pipes, and somehow all of the drain pipes, the way the building was built, the drain pipes somehow go under the building, and the sand that his apartment is sitting on has gotten soft because of the liquid, because of, because of the water that's coming down. And if you look at the history of the world, look at the history of the world, many more people have died as a result of water than as a result of fire. And once in a while there's a big fire, so you know a few hundred or a few thousand people die from fire. You have a tsunami, wiped out a quarter of a million people. You know, you got, you're flooding and tsunamis, that sort of thing. They just had a flood somewhere in Libya. About, about what was it, 11,000 people died because a dam broke in Libya, that sort of thing. Water is tremendous, tremendous. Day. But water is the biggest bracha. We need water. You can't exist without water. So the Torah says, the Torah says that if you're good, by the way, can we turn on the air? If you're, if you're good, the, um, um, the, 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 you'll have the rain. And if not, then you're going to be punished. Now, here, Moshe Rabbeinu says, my words will come to you like rain, which means he's obviously comparing Torah to water. What is the comparison? Why, where there, there are a few other comparisons between Torah and water. First of all, when you water plants, when you water plants, you, how long does it take to see the effect? It takes a while. It takes a while. It doesn't happen right away. It takes a, the watering of plants, you know, it takes a while until the plant, they have videos of you know sped up films where they film a plant growing, and they have a sped up film and it's like, right, and it just grows, but it doesn't happen that way. It doesn't really happen that way. You know, you water it, and you water it some more, and you water it some more. A, tree, a, tree, a plant grows, a tree grows. Yeah, how long it takes for a tree to grow? It takes a long time, but one thing is clear: that as you water it, it's having an effect, right? It's having an effect. Torah affects a person, but you don't see the effects right away. Sometimes you want to learn Torah and, you know, instant chafetz chayim. Do, 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 come, I will bless you, my children. No, no, it doesn't work that way. You have to learn Torah and then you learn Torah for like, you know, sometimes we look at the big tzaddikim of the generation. You know, if you look at uh, Rav Dov Landau or you look at uh, Rav Gershon Edelstein, that's all. You look at Rav Chaim Kineski, it took a long time. He wasn't born. It didn't, didn't happen overnight. It's a long watering process. The Torah is a watering process. And therefore, the comparison of Torah to rain and water is the same way that a plant has to be nurtured by the water and it takes plant time to develop. Similar with Torah, it takes time to develop, number one. Number two, the, uh, 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 you know the famous story of Rabbi Akiva? And Rabbi Akiva was, what, 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 got, what got to Rabbi Akiva? Right? The dripping, the dripping on the stone. So he goes out there and he takes a look and he sees water is dripping on the stone and it made a crevice. And Rabbi Kiva said, well, if water, which is soft, could penetrate a stone, which is hard, so Torah, which is a fire, could certainly penetrate my, my heart, which is flesh and blood. That's what Rabbi Akiva, that's what Rabbi Akiva saw from the stone. But remember we pointed out once that 
Have you ever been, have you ever seen that? Ever seen like been on a, on a hike and you see a rock that looks like it's creviced out from water flowing over it or it's smooth, the, the, the rock is smoothed over from, the, from the, 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 the stream that's flowing over it or something's dripping, right? You've seen these things, right? So I've always been intrigued. You know, I could stand there for an hour. You could stand there for an hour. You're not going to see a difference, right? You stand there for an hour, the rock looks exactly the same. I've seen drinking fountains that have, you know, these fountains at a park which are actually a little bit car carved out. Now, if you stand there for an hour running the water, are you going to see a difference though? No, no difference. So which drop was it that made the difference when Rabbi Kiva looked at it? It has to be. That means it has to be that even the first drop that ever hit that stone that Rabbi Kiva was looking at, the first drop must have had an effect. It was a micro, micro, whatever micro, how many micros you want to put on there, but it had to have an effect. What's the proof? Because if it had zero effect whatsoever, then the next drop would be the first drop. And that would have a zero effect. If the first drop doesn't have an effect, so there's no reason to think that the second drop, which now becomes the first drop, has an effect. Torah anytime, people, don't worry about that siren. That's just a siren. The, uh, the uh, what do you call it? That just means that we're studying Torah well. The, uh, the uh, what do you call it? That means they, 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 they don't, you know, that's the eight Sahara trying to bother us. The, uh, you're not going to get us. Right. So, so the, 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 what do you call it? The, the, the first drop that becomes, the second drop becomes the first drop. And the third drop becomes the first drop if the second drop didn't have an effect. So it must be the first drop that had an effect. So what it's telling you is Torah, we're learning Torah right now. You just learned Torah the hour before it had an effect on you. Did you feel the effect? No, you don't necessarily feel the effect. But what happens to a guy who comes to our Sameach and after three months or six months, his behavior is different. He's more refined. He's, everything about him, what, what, which day was it that changed him? The answer is there wasn't one day. There wasn't one day. It was a process, and the process is a gradual process. That's the, that's the comparison to Torah, number one. Number two, number two is that um, the same way when rain, you know, let's say you're a farmer, you got vegetation. Rain comes into your field. What do you then have to do with your field? What do you have to do? You have to work the field. Right? You have to start working the field. You have to plow it. You have to give it plant it. You have to, you have to dig it. You have to turn it over. You have to make sure to pull out, pull out the weeds. Everything, uh, everything that, a, that, that a farmer does. Right? You have to do everything, everything you could possibly do. When you're working a field, you have to do everything. Every, you have to work it. So... The Mepharshim say that the same thing comes with Torah. When you study Torah, it's not enough to study Torah and to, you know, to, to lean back and hear a shear and just, you know, you have to work, you have to work. Do it fair, don't, don't, try not to munch in the, in the, in the it's just not honor for it. It's not, not, not respectful for the Torah. The, we, you, have to, you have to, what do you call it? You have to uh, 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 apply yourself both to Torah and to character development. That means if we learn Torah, by learning Torah, we've watered ourselves, but we still got to work on ourselves. It doesn't happen automatically. So if a person has a tendency to get angry, for example, right? A person, person is always getting, getting angry. You have to work on not getting angry. When you learn Torah, so you enter, it's almost like a weightlifter. It's almost like a weightlifter who, uh, who what do you call it, who, who eats a certain diet of certain, he takes vitamins to help him to, to pump up muscle. But he's got to still pump the iron, right? It's not enough to do the steroids. He's got to pump the iron also. You know, does, you got you to apply yourself. You gotta, so the Torah is, we absorb, without Torah, nothing's going to happen. But even after we learn Torah, a person has to apply himself, just like when the rain comes down, then you have to start working the fields. That's the lesson over here. Number three, the, uh, uh, there's, another, there's, a difference between, there's a difference between rain and dew. Anybody know, what's the difference between rain and dew? There's a very big difference. Rain comes down from the time, I guess. Right, and... and that we, we look at it as coming from earth. Very good. That means there are two parts of Torah. There are two parts of Torah. There's Torah Shebik Sav, the written Torah, which Moshe Rabbeinu brings down from the heavens. And then there's Torah Shebaal Peh. Now, Torah Shebaal Peh also comes down from Shebaim. But what's our role when it comes to Torah Shebaal Peh? What are we doing when we're studying Gemara, or even when you're learning Torah, what are you trying to do as you're studying it, you're thinking up, producing interesting insights or new ideas, what we call chidushim, navale in Torah. That means part of what we're learning is coming from down here, so to speak. That means Torah shibik sav, when it comes to the written Torah, written Torah, we don't tamper it. There's nothing to touch. 
the big blue book over here, this is the written Torah. We don't tamper with that. It is what it is. There's no adding. There's no, there's no innovating Torah. They can't innovate. There's no, there's no New Testament. The New Testament means, you know, well, you know, God changed his mind and he, he gave some, some new instructions. Right? He had a bad day when he gave the old ones, and therefore he changed his mind and gave them. No, 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 there's no. There's no tampering. God didn't have a bad day. There's no tampering with the written Torah. Written Torah directly down from heaven. The do represents our, initi our involvement where we produce from down here. We learn Torah, and then you come up with your own idea and your own insight, your own, which were all given at Sinai. Right? The Gemara says, whatever a student, a disciple, Anybody who studies Torah in history, Moshe Rabbeinu got it all. If you came up with a new idea, even a gematria, or a new insight into the Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu already heard it. Except that it's down here for us to innovate on our own as long as it's legitimate innovation and it's not changing the Torah, not tampering with the Torah. Whereas the written Torah is the rain. But there's another difference. Now, Think to yourselves about rain. What's your reaction if you're caught it in a rainstorm? Run. You run. What else? You try, you, try to get into, you try to get out of the rain. What does it do to your mood? I was going to say, you run. And while you're running, what are you doing? Ducking. What? Ducking. Ducking. And what else are you doing? Probably swearing, right? You know, but uh, <laughs> chas v'sholom, chas v'sholom. Right. Wait, you're, you're not in a great mood, right? While you're, when, it, when you get caught in a rainstorm, you're not in a great mood. And as a matter of fact, we're about to learn, we, Yom Kippur is coming. And on the holiest day of the year, the coin Godel went into the Holy of Holies. <coughs> Davin for the whole Jewish people, right? He went in the Holy of Holies. What was one of his, what was one part of his prayer? One part of his prayer is, please Hashem, do not accept the prayers of travelers who get caught in the rain. That's what the coin Godel was davening on Yom Kippur. Right? Please, because uh, when a guy gets caught in the rain and you get caught in a rainstorm, right? <laughs> oh no! And you daven, right? Now listen how amazing this is. The coin Godel on Yom Kippur in the Holy of Holies, one time in the entire, one day the entire year, what's he davening for? To offset the prayer of some guy in a, in, in a sweatsuit who got caught in a, in a storm. You know why? Because the guy in a sweatsuit who got so, caught in a storm, that's a solid tefillah. Now that's a prayer. Right? And that record, that shows you what the, what the strength of prayer is. Tefillah. That, tells, that shows you how potent tefillah You know how potent tefillah is? That, uh, that it could rain and one guy in a sweatsuit could say a tefillah and it might offset the entire rain that Hashem has brought down. And therefore it takes the coin guttle on Yom Kippur to David. Please don't accept those prayers. So when rain, rain could be unpleasant. What about dew? Nobody's upset about dew. Dew's kind of, you know, you get up in the morning, you're on your way to Minion, or you're on your way to go play tennis, and there's dew on the grass, and it doesn't bother anybody. It's kind of pleasant. Kind of pleasant. So the commentaries say that the comparison of Torah to rain and dew is addressing the teachers, the rabbis, anybody who teaches Torah. On the one hand, you got to teach rain, meaning you got to bring down a lot to the students. You got to teach them a lot of Torah. On the other hand, make sure it's pleasant. It's got to be like do, that it shouldn't be harsh, and it shouldn't be overwhelming, and it should be pleasant, that it should be as pleasant, that the Torah should be as enjoyable as do. That's what the, that's what the commentaries say. Okay, now, take a look at the next one, because the next one is the real part I want to get to. Kishem Hashem Ekro When I call the name of Hashem, ascribe greatness to our God. We learned from here that you have to make brachas before you learn Torah. There's what's called Birkas HaTorah. You get up in the morning and you make the Bakishem Hashem Ekra, the Gemara says in Brachos. We learn from this Pasuk that when you learn Torah, you have to make a Bracha. Just like you make a Bracha about anything that you enjoy in life, you have to make a Bracha on Torah. Now, there's a very big difference between Torah and food. What happens after you finish eating? You make a Bracha, you make a bracha right? You've got to make an after Bracha. Right? You finish eating, you make, if, you, if you ate bread, you've got a bench. Sometimes you know, every, every people say, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like washing. Every people say that? No, I, I, yeah. Are you going to eat bread? No, I don't feel like washing. I got news for you. The washing is never the problem. The problem is the benching. And if you, when people say, I don't feel like washing, what they really mean is, I don't feel like benching. Right? I don't mind washing. Washing takes two seconds. The, the benching is the issue. So, uh, no, no, I'm not going to eat bread. I'm gonna, I, I, I don't, I don't want to bench. Right? I don't want to bless God 
and thank him for my sustenance for three minutes, right? That's what a person is really saying. By the way, Rabbi Steinman's wife, Rabbi Zin Steinman got sick, the Rabbi Steinman was the God of the His wife, towards the end of her life, she, she had to be fed through a, through a uh, what do you call a feeding tube. So somebody once asked her, you know, I mean, obviously you would say it wasn't pleasant, and somebody asked her what's going through her mind. So you know what she said? She said, I miss, you know, the, 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 what bothers me about this? I miss being able to bench. That wasn't, that wasn't what you were thinking, was it, Nathan? Well, most people, if you'd ask them about a feeding tube, what would their problem be? I miss being able to eat. Right? No, she, she didn't say anything about the eating. She said, I miss being able to bench. It puts benching into perspective. But there's a big question here, gentlemen. How come there's no after bracha on, on, on learning? We never right? stop. Oh, very good. Because even when we're sleeping, people are learning in other places. Yeah, but that's there. That's there. But what about you? Yeah, but when, when, you're, when you're not eating, people are eating in other places. You still got to make a bracha after you eat. Right? That doesn't help because you're right. Learning never stops in the world, but neither does eating. Right? So you still got to make. The answer is, what do you mean you're done? I'm not done learning. I happen to be going to sleep right now. You always have, an, we have, every man has an obligation to, to be learning. If you have nothing else that you have to do, so you should be learning Torah. Right? That's an obligation, each person according to his level. We're never like, okay, all done for the day. Right? Now let's hit the bar. No, it doesn't work that way. You're, you're never done. Right? Now I have to take a break. When I was at camp, I was in a, in a Chabad camp when I was about nine years old, Camp Gan Yisrael in Detroit. So they had... Where you got Israel? Yeah, okay. So I was nine years old. So they have activities. First they have a learning session in camps. So Those all the from camps do. They have learning. And then they have the activities for the day. So we'd have like a learning group. How did they end? How did they announce the learning, the end of the learning group? I still remember I was nine years old. That's all I remember from the camp. Right? What did they what did they announce? They would say, they on the loudspeaker, they'd say, time for learning never ends. Time for learning never ends. First activity in 10 minutes. <laughs> That's how they would announce it. They wouldn't say, let's stop learning. They didn't say, let's stop learning. Okay? Learn, learning never ends. But right now, it's time for, for what do you call it? Time for the first activity. That's why we don't make an after bracha. Okay, now let's go on. Because this is what I want to really get to today. This was the one, not this. Not this. Puzzle Dalit. Hatsur Tomim Paolo. The rock... His work is perfect. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is described as the rock. Ki kol drachav mishpat. All of his ways are just. Kel emunah ve'inavel. He's a God of faith. There's no, uh, 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 how does he translate, uh, uh, iniquity? Uh, no, uh, uh, okay, iniquity. Tzadik v'yosherhu. He is righteous and just. Okay, now, the first thing is that we have to understand the Torah is making a declaration. Moshe Rabbeinu is saying this. Why is Moshe Rabbeinu declaring God is perfect, God's justice is perfect. So there's no coincidence that Moshe Rabbeinu is saying it because this is the day Moshe Rabbeinu is about to die. And when the Jewish people who've had Moshe Rabbeinu the, 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 for 40 years as their leader, you know, a person come along and say, Moshe Rabbeinu? He's got to die? Where, how, what, what did he ever do wrong? Number one, he can't go into the land of Israel with us? God's punishing him? Well, that's not fair. That's the punishment Moshe Rabbeinu is getting? So the first thing Moshe Rabbeinu says to the Jewish people, hey, hey, Hatsur Tamim Tolo, God's perfect. God is perfect. Don't have, any, don't have any questions. If God is not letting me go into Israel, God knows what he's doing. And it works for a human being as well. You know, sometimes people look around. What's the most famous question people always ask? The Gomorrah even asks it. Why do bad things happen to good people? Excellent. Why do the righteous suffer? Now, yeah, sometimes you get a guy who seems like a very big tzaddik, and he's poor. Why should he be poor? So the problem is we don't see the whole story. We don't know the whole story. For all we know, and it's not my idea, but the Chafetz Chaim says this, this guy lived once before. He may be a reincarnation. In his previous life, he was good. He only had one character flaw. You know what it was? He was haughty. He was a wealthy man, and he was a Balgaiva. He was haughty. So when his neshama was tapped and told, you've got to come back into this world, which neshamas don't want to do, by the way. Neshamas do not want to come back here. And when his neshama was told, you got to go back to fix that up, to fix up that haughtiness. So you know what he begged in the heavenly court? He said, listen, do me a favor. Don't give me money this time around. The money was my ruin last time. And he himself asks for poverty. And he comes back in this world and he's poor. Now, having said that, gentlemen, 
you can never look at somebody and know why he is suffering a certain way. We only know ideas and we know concepts. We are, you need a prophet to know why any particular person comes from Cleveland. Right. Why did he have to be from Cleveland? Oh, he must have been wicked in a previous world. Okay, yeah, it was either, you know, they didn't know what to do with this guy, so they, you know, they, they decided to dump him in Cleveland. Right? No, no, no. Yeah, we don't know why anybody is from Cleveland. You know, we don't know why anybody is poor. We don't know why anybody has illness. We don't know in, a, on a, in an individual level. We only know possibilities. It could be a guy who was ill in a previous world who was big and strong, and he was haughty because of that. Or because maybe he used his strength to beat people up. So God said, okay, now you got to go back and i got to turn you into a weak person who's, who's, who's fragile so that you won't repeat that. So we have no idea. We have no idea why. We have no idea. All we know is that whatever goes around and whatever we see happening in this world, we understand that there's a reason for it. And I want to tell you two midrashim. One is a medrash and one is a, also an obscure medrash. Some of you have heard it before. But I want to tell you, one of a very obscure measure is not clear where the source is. Some of you have heard me tell this before, but it's a very, very powerful idea. There is a, a, when Moshe Rabbeinu asked God, why the righteous suffer? Why the wicked prosper? Why the righteous suffer? When Moshe Rabbeinu was up on Harsina. So there's a medrash that says the following. God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, I'm going to try to give you an insight into my justice in the world, but it's only the tip of the iceberg. It's only an idea. It's an example and if you understand this, then you'll extend it. You can apply it to everything else. But, but at, at, at a basic level, I'll try to give you an insight. So God shows Moshe Rabbeinu a vision. And in this vision, Moshe Rabbeinu sees a soldier riding on a horse. And the soldier, it's a very hot day, and he gets to a water hole. And he gets off his horse, and he bends down to take a drink at the water hole. And he's got a money pouch in his pocket. And the money pouch falls out by the water hole. The soldier doesn't notice, and he gets on his horse and he rides away. A short while later, a 10-year-old boy comes by. He goes to take a drink, sees a pouch, opens up the pouch. Wow, terrific. Me and my mother are going to have some Parnassa now. He runs home to his mother, with the, happy with his, with, his, with his money pouch. A short while later, a little old man comes by. He goes over to the water hole, takes a drink, and he lies down to go to sleep. It's a hot day. In the meantime, the soldier's on the horse. And he checks his pocket, doesn't understand, where's, where's, my, where's, the, where's the money? Can't really try to think, where's my money pouch? So he realizes that he must have, the only place could be where he dropped, where he bent over at the water hole. So he goes, he rides back to the water hole, and he sees there's a little old man is lying there sleeping. So he walks over to the old man, he gives a good hard kick, and he wakes him up. He says, old man, give me my money. The old man looks up, he says, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, listen, I'm in a hurry, I haven't got time. If you don't give me my money, I'm going to kill you. The old man says, I really don't know. I just got here. I haven't seen your money. The soldier takes his sword, kills the old man, searches his pockets, and sure enough, doesn't find anything, gets on the horse, and he rides away. The vision fades, and God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, you see, there's perfect justice in the world. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I am clueless. So God says, I'll show you another vision. Maybe this will help you. And he shows Moshe Rabbeinu a forest, a thick forest, and in the forest there's a clearing. In the middle of the forest there's a clearing. And he sees a father is walking along with his two-year-old toddler son in the clearing in the forest. And there's a soldier sitting on a horse back in the thickness of the forest. And he's looking at, he's watching this father and his son. He sees them, he's watching them. And from the other side of the forest, suddenly a bandit jumps out, starts wrestling around with the father. And eventually he overpowers the father. He pulls out a dagger and he stabs the father to death, searches his pockets, and he finds a money pouch. And he grabs this money pouch and he starts to run away. He's in such a hurry to get away, he carelessly drops the money pouch. The soldier has been watching the entire scene unfold, sees the money pouch fall, comes riding in, picks up the money pouch, and he rides off. And again, the vision fades, and God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, see, there's perfect justice in the world. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I don't understand. So God says, okay, now I'm going to explain it to you, and just remember this is only the tip of the iceberg. There's only one example, and then you'll see that everything that I do is all reckoned and thought out well. The first vision that I showed you by the waterhole actually took place 10 years after the second vision, which took place in the forest. The soldier who dropped his money at the waterhole in the first vision, 10 years earlier, he found that, that, that money pouch in the forest when the bandit was running away and he had carelessly dropped it. The 10-year-old boy 
12-year-old boy at the water hole who found the pouch in the first scene I showed you. Ten years earlier was a two-year-old toddler whose father was murdered. He should have inherited the money then. It took ten years and eventually the money came back to him. And the little old man who was brutally murdered at the water hole ten years earlier was a strong <coughs> bandit who murdered the father. And the soldier who was in the, so in the forest who should have intervened it took 10 years, and the same soldier caught him at the water hole, and he killed him at the water hole. So as Moshe Rabbeinu, everything falls into place. You just got to know the entire picture. And everything in life falls into place. And you may not understand, and you may not, we, we cert, not we may not understand. We don't understand. And we have no idea why, but at the end of the day, Hatsur Tomim Polo, it all works out. Why was the father murdered? There was a reason for that also. Why, why, why you know, there's always, he's just showing you that everything has, everything falls into place. One way or another, it falls into place. That was the first medrash. There's another medrash that Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi once met Eliyahu Anavi, the prophet Eliyahu. And he said to Eliyahu Anavi, I would like to spend some time with you. And I'd like to go around with you and see what you do. You know, the prophet Eliyahu comes back to earth and he does all sorts of neat stuff. So he said to him, I'd like to go with you. I'd like to travel with Eliyahu and see what happens. So Eliyahu and I said to Rabbi Shavu Levi, okay, but you're going to see a lot of things you don't understand. And you're not allowed to ask me any questions. And if you ask and demand an explanation, at that moment there's a game over. I'm leaving and you're not going to go with me anymore. So Rabbi and Levi said, okay, that's a, yeah, I, it's, a, it's a deal. So they start traveling and they get to a, uh, they get to a, they say, they get to a certain town. And there's a very wealthy man. And uh, no one in the town is willing to invite them in. And eventually this wealthy man invites them into the house. They, they knock on the door. He's a very wealthy man, a big, beautiful mansion. They knock on his door. And he said, we, do you mind if we spend the night with you? And he says, I mind very much. You may not spend the night with They go out in the barn. Go sleep in the barn. So they go off into the barn. They sleep in the barn. In the middle of the night, Elion Navi gets up. And he, with Elion Navi powers... He builds a new, ex an extension from this mansion, a massive extension. And Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi is like, what? It, no, look, get no, no questions. Okay. So they finish, and then they start traveling. And they get to another town. There's a little shack. They knock on the shack. A guy opens the door. Poor man. He welcomes them in. He says, listen, I wish I had more to feed you. He gives them whatever he's eating, they're eating. He tries to put them up as comfortably as possible for the night. In the middle of the night, now this poor man is being supported. He's got a cow that he uses for milk. That's his main source of support. In the middle of the night, Elio Navi goes, he gets up, he goes into the barn, he says something, the cow dies. And the Shuvah Levi's going nuts. He goes, wow. No questions. Then they go to another town. And no one in the town is willing to host them. So as they leave the town, Eliana says, may you all rise to prominence. And then they go to the third, the last town, and all the people fight over them. Who's going to be the host? And finally they stay by somebody's house, and as they leave the town, Eliana says, may only one of you rise to prominence. And by this point, Rabbi Yeshua Levi is going nuts. He says, okay, that's it. I, got on. I, I don't care. Game over, but tell me what's going on here. That jerk who put us in the barn, the first rich guy, and you get up in the moonlight, the guy with, with such a nasty, and, and you go and you build him a new, a new wing on his mansion. And Eliana says, well, what he doesn't know is that underneath, underneath that wing there's a buried treasure, and that wing's going to collapse in a matter of days, and he's never going to find the treasure. Ah, ah. And, and what about the poor guy? You killed the cow. They were so nice to us. Why'd you kill his cow? He says, well, because he was nice to us, what you're not aware of, that there was a decree in heaven that at midnight his wife was supposed to die. But because he was so nice to us, I was able to intervene and substitute the cow for his wife. So the cow died instead of his wife because he was so nice to us. Uh-huh. And uh, what about that town you, you blessed the nasty, the, those mean people that they should all rise to prominence? He says, yeah, well, when everybody rises to prominence, all they're going to do is have a whole lot of fighting. And the biggest bracha for a town is only one person rises to prominence and he could be the leader of the town, he could be the rub, and he could guide them successfully. So you know, he says to Yeshua Levi, what a Kodesh Baruch Hu, he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. And that's what a person has to live with the belief, 
of of Hatsur Tamim Kol. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you, there's there's a couple. Well, just one second. We say in um, in the Yud Gimel Midos, Hashem Hashem, you know the the the, the I don't know. You guys have been saying it for about 40, 40 days, right? Yeah, the 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 way. What are you smiling, Nisim? Yes, yeah, forty days you've been saying it, right? Well, not yet. You'll get up to Ben Sion. <laughs> oh, yeah, Hashem, Hashem. How do you sing? What's the tune? Oh, there, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> not quite like that. It's not quite like that. So, so in the Hashem Hashem, we say the Yud Gimel, Hashem Hashem, Kel, Rachum, Vechanu, and Erech Abayim, he's, he's merciful, Rav Chesed, Ve'emes. How is Emes? Emes? Truth? These are the 13 attributes of mercy. I mean, if you ask me, truth, it actually sounds more like Din, doesn't it? Truth means we hold you to a very exacting standard. And we're talking about the attributes of mercy, the Hashem is Chesed, kindness, and... He overlooks it. Why emes? Emes means you get what you deserve. Isn't that true? So why is that considered one of the attributes of mercy? The answer is that, again, there are different approaches. One of the answers, the commentaries say, down here on earth, down here on earth, when a man commits a crime, somebody commits a crime, so he goes to court, and he robbed the bank, he killed somebody, whatever it was, they sentenced him to 15 years in jail. What about his wife? What about his kids? What about his family? What about the effect, the, the, the effect on other people? The judge doesn't take that into account. The judge thinks, listen, this guy doesn't care about his wife, family. Why should I? But even without thinking that, the judge can't possibly. What does the judge do? The judge takes a look, and the judge says, you committed a crime, 15 years, you got it a clink. What will be with his wife and children? It's a problem. So now they get punished, even if they had nothing to do with anything. They're, 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 they, they, they're, they're punished, right? HaKadosh Baruch Hu's judgment is emes. Emes means that if a person is meant to suffer, let's say one person, chas a person dies, but then his next of kin suffer the pain, his friends suffer the pain, the people he owes money to suffer the pain, his neighbors may suffer the pain, everybody around him is going to suffer a certain amount of pain depending on how close they are to this person, right? If some of those people don't deserve that pain, then this person isn't going to die. That's emes. That means when a Kosh takes everything into account. That's why it's a meat of mercy. If Ruvain has to die, but as a result of Ruvain dying, Shimon is going to get pain that he doesn't deserve, then Ruvain won't die. And based on this, the Chafetz Chaim says, the, the commentaries, the Bali Musar say, one of the biggest merits a person could have going into Yom Kippur is that he's somebody who services the community. You're the gabai, you could be the chazan, you could be a charity collector, you could be anything that you do for the community, that means the entire community needs you. So if this person's going to die, every, a lot of people are going to suffer, but maybe those people don't need that suffering. They, they, maybe this guy deserves to die, but maybe there's somebody in the community who doesn't deserve to suffer his death. That could be the merit that keeps him alive. That's what it means, emes. A person who says, you know, somebody, and by the way, there's a reason for it, because people who serve the community... It generally, you get criticized. You don't get thanked. Ask any gabai of a shul. Very few people come to the gabai and say, great job on Rosh Hashanah. Most people, hey, how come I didn't get the seat that I wanted? And why did the chaz, how come I didn't get the aliyah? You know, very few people come up to the gabai and say, wow, yeah, we're pretty sure what are you doing for you? They think that the gabai is just like a, you know, he just loves it. You know, just great job, be the gabai, right? So if a person <coughs> is, 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 he, he services the community, servicing the community could actually be a merit for a person, Okay? All right, I'll tell you one, one more incredible story. You know, there's a story, a guy, there's a documented story. There was a, um, there was a guy in uh, one of the ghettos. So there's a girl, and the girl, a 15, 16-year-old girl. So this girl gets arrested, and she's taken to Nazi headquarters. Her brother comes home, he sees the parents are crying. And the brother says, what's going on? He says, the girl was taken to Nazi head. He marches down to Nazi headquarters, and he says, uh, I want to speak to the commandant. 
So the guards see him, and there's a Jew who wants to go in to speak to the commandant. So Jerry, you know, they have this kind of cynical smile. Say, like, all right, our pleasure, go on in. So he walks into the commandant, and he says to the commandant, they, they let him in. The commandant says, what do you want, Jew dog? He says, I want my sister, and I want her now. The guy looks at him. He says, I want to explain something to you, buddy. You got as much chance of getting your sister back. I'll give you your sister back if hair grows on your palm. So the guy opens up his palm, and sure enough, he's got a line of hair on his palm. And the Nazi goes berserk. He says, you Jew a sorcerer, get her and get her out of here. He goes berserk. What happened? What happened? About seven years earlier, he had, had gotten his hand caught in a meat grinder. And they did a skin graft on him. And they grafted from part of the body that had hair on it onto his palm. Now imagine, seven years earlier when it happened, imagine what the reaction was. The pain, the anguish, the skin, the graft, oh, a scar. Oh, imagine, imagine how painful that was seven years earlier. Why me? Why did it happen to me? And all of a sudden, seven years later, it saves his sister's life. Right? So anything that happens, a person doesn't know, a person does not know why, why it's happening. I once heard about a lady the lady was in her 50s, and she got sick, and she was deathly sick. She was, she, was in, she was in the final stages. And somebody said to her, aren't you upset? I mean, why is God picking on you? You know what this lady said? It's phenomenal. The lady said to her, you know, when I was in school, I was very popular, and I never said, why me? Other girls weren't as popular. And then I went, I got married, and I got married to a wonderful man, and it went very quickly. I didn't have problems waiting to get married. And when it happened, I never said to myself, why me? And then I got pregnant right, right away. There were other many women who didn't have children right away, didn't have children at all. And when I had children, I never said, why me? And I had a wonderful family. And I never once said, why me? So now that things have gone a little, things have gone south a little bit, I also, I'm not going to say, why me? I never said why me before. I'm not going to say why be right now. Because I was the life of a person. Nobody who, when something good happens, nobody ever says why me. I don't believe anybody who's won the lottery starts crying and say why me. To the contrary, if I don't win the lottery, I say why me. And I, I don't say why me. I say well, what's taking so long, right? And a person doesn't win the lottery. A person wins the lottery. No, he says why me. Well, obviously I deserve that. That's a mistaken approach in life. person has to know that whatever is happening, whatever is happening in life, you, get, you should know that it's a... Yesterday I had to go, yes, I had to go give a talk somewhere. So I got on the bus to go give a talk. I had to get to Harnoff. I got on the bus to give a talk. And the bus was draining. There was traffic. And what do you call it? And I'm like, oh, I should have left hours earlier. And I was really like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to be calm. This is all for the best, this, that, and the other. And then I got to the next bus stop where I was planning to take a cab, and I put out my finger, tried to flag down a cab. The cab just zipped right past me. And then an Avrech, a Kolo guy, stops in his car. I wasn't even trying to flag, I wasn't trying to hitch, I was just trying to stop. Flag. The guy stops in his car. He says, where are you going to? I said, I'm going to her. No, he said, oh, that's exactly where I'm going. He took me right to the door. Right? What, what do you call it? So, you know, sometimes it's not going so well. I was really, I was on the bus. I was not a happy camper. On the bus, I was not. I was trying to, you know, activate all forms of Gamzula Tova crunch, you know. <laughs> and, and, I, and I was, I was getting tense, and, and, and then also next thing you know, boom, it drops me off right at the door. See, you never know. What you never know. Sometimes it goes our way. Sometimes it goes. It goes wrong with the guy. It's all. That's how Sur told me, Polo. I want to speak about this a little more tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, right.